Hello and welcome to The Hearing, I'm John. And from Chicago's north side, I'm Scotto. And before we get to this week's album, just a little bit of a news story. This is from the New York Times. And on Zombie Take It, we had a story from Time. Here we're doing the New York Times. We really, <laughs> stepped, we really stepped up this week. We should um, have the Masterpiece Theater theme uh, before. <laughs> uh, headline, what do those Spotify top fans messages mean? And this is just a short excerpt from the story. Um, when asked about the messages, Peter Collins, a spokesperson for Spotify, declined to provide any information on how many fans received them, how the percentages were calculated, or what it meant to be in the top percentile, percentile of an artist's fan base. Mr. Collins did classify the message as a, quote, test, continuing, quote, At Spotify, we routinely conduct a number of tests in an effort to improve our user experience, unquote. He said in a statement, quote, Some of those tests end up paving the path for our broader user experience, while others serve only as an important learning. We're on, uh, we aren't going to comment on specific tests at this time, unquote. So there is no interpretation of it. Huh. Okay. So, yeah, they're not saying what it means specifically. It's probably some random piece of data they were looking for that they just decided. They figured it would probably help them go viral, so they put it on there. I mean, it's fun, you know? Mm-hmm. It, it's been fun. I, I, how many years they've been doing it in a yeah. row? I think for at oh, least yeah. four. Um, and and so since we were debating a bit about what that meant, I just wanted to get, put that in there. And on to this week's album, which is from 1978, and a year after the movie we reviewed this week. Yeah. Ex- Excitable Boy by Warren Zevon. Warren Zevon it was an American singer-songwriter known for his dry wit and sardonic acerbic lyrics, and probably best known for his songs Werewolves of London, uh, Lears, Guns, and Money, and Excitable Boy, all of which appear on the album Excitable Boy, which is Zivon's third studio album. It was released on January 18th, 1978, on Asylum Records, produced by Jackson Brown, that surprised me, <laughs> and Wadi Watel, and features Warren Zivon on lead vocals, harmony and backing vocals, piano, organ, and synthesizer. He played all the keyboards on the album. He was a much better keyboard player than I ever thought. Um, yeah. Jorge Calderon on harmony and backing vocals and Spanish vocals on Vel- Veracruz. Danny Korchmar on guitar and percussion. Russ Kunkel on drums. And many, many additional musicians, including Jackson Brown on guitar, harmony and backing vocals. John McVie, bass on Werewolves of London. Mick Fleetwood, drums on Werewolves of London. London. Literally really? Fleetwood Mac played for the rhythm section on Werewolves of London. I never knew that. Jeff Percaro, drums and percussion on Nighttime in the Switching Yard. Linda Ronstadt, backing vocals and harmony vocals on Excitable Boy. Leland Sklar, bass guitar on Johnny Strikes Up the Band and Accidentally a Martyr. Wadi Watel, guitar, synthesizer, harmony and backing vocals. I just picked out, you know, the the a list of backing players on this. <laughs> Reminder, don't edit any songs into our reviews for copyright reasons, but down in the description, if you're watching, listening to this on YouTube, or on our blog at johnandscottup.com, you'll find links to Excitable Boy on, on Spotify and YouTube, so you can follow along if you'd like. On to track one, Johnny Strikes Up the Band. Not much to say about this one, it is my pick for weakest. It's a, it's a, it's very 70s. Uh... Yeah, exactly, it's very of its time. It is the uh, the planet, uh, as we joked on Zombie Take, I think we did a movie in the mm-hmm. 70s early on. Yeah. It was uh, the 1970s is a planet. Yeah. There, there's no other explanation for it. It's planet 70s, yeah. Um, like you can go to other periods of time and say, okay, they were doing this because they didn't have this technology. But the 70s just has this distinct, like, why the fuck did they do this? Yeah. <laughs> And and it, the lyrics don't say much. It's it's very forgettable. Nice ending guitar solo, but that bass line starts it off mm-hmm. with just so seventies yeah. with the cowbell too, of course. Of course, <laughs> but this does give me an opportunity to point something out that really surprised me on this album. I'm I like Zevon. I've no like three songs on this album with the back of my hand. I know a, a, the odd song here or there. I'm a moderate fan of Warren Zevon, but I noticed connections to two of my biggest heroes yeah i hear a lot of vonnegut in his lyrics hmm. there's a lot of so it goes in his lyrics 
And on a couple of songs, Greg Graffin has practically ripped the melody verbatim. <laughs> there is a ton of Graffin in his vocals. Now, his voice, I mean, he's like only, what's he, like 33 or something <laughs> around now? Um, oh. Or 30 years older at this time? Oh, yeah, probably. But he sounds so old on this song. Mm. Like, he sounds like like an 80-year-old man. Like, he sounds like Johnny Cash before he kicked off. <laughs> <laughs> and he's only 30. Well, that's always, that's been the interest, that was the interesting thing about Zivon's voice. Because it was very deep and very, it had a lot of um, emotion. Not emotion in the, in the sense of an emotional singer, but he was a great s- s- speaking singer. Yeah, and it's it's why I won't pick this one for weakest because I think I think they got he got out on time. It's like a quick two and a half minute thing. Yeah. I'm kind of trying to figure out what he you know the lyrics on it. I didn't get a chance to look at them, but it's just kind of this. Uh, you know, Maybe and a lot there's... of his is about the lyrics, of course, for and, his and, songs. And among the rest of the album, they really make some great points. Mm-hmm. One of the couple of them, sadly, are still relevant, very relevant. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, but on this one, it just kind of seems maybe there's more to it. Maybe there's something I'm overlooking, but it kind of just feels seems like it is what it is. On the, it's, it is what it says on the ten. Yeah, it could very well be. It's just about a, a band, someone you know striking up a band. It just seems very much like you know a lot of songs of in the seventies and eighties were just about how great music was. <laughs> just the obsession of listening to songs on the radio i mean that, yeah. that is kind of i always marvel at that hey what should we write a song about hey, let's just let's just write a song about listening to a song on the radio mm-hmm. so of course you'd... that was kind of a shameless bit to right, try to right. get your song played right. on the radio yourself which right. yeah was everything and i get why this was you know put first on the record because um, it's striking up the band. Yeah, exactly. Um, incidentally, um, the record company decided to put Werewolves of London out as the first single. Zevon protested. He wanted Johnny Strikes Up the Band to be the first single. Hmm. Which is an odd choice. I think the record... I rarely say this about record companies, but I think they were right. Sometimes they've got it right. You know, sometimes the artist is like, you know, they're uh-huh. just married close to, to their a own song yeah. and they want that out. But sometimes mm-hmm. the record company with it, but this is going to sell. Yeah, this is the one that's going to move albums, and they were right. On to track two, Roland the Headless Thompson Gunner, going to, from my weakest to my pick for favorite. Love the sort of classical opening riff, love the sparse arrangement. This is the one where I, I heard Graffin. And some of the melody on this, he has ripped off verbatim. It's a very odd duck, this song. Yes. <laughs> I've never heard this one before. Uh, there's some great imagery in the lyrics. It's got this big anthemic chorus, although it's just the title of the song or a variation because Roland's not headless in the first couple of choruses. <laughs> and it's he's talking about this, you know, Dutch guy mm-hmm. killing her around in Africa, but it's it's got this whole Native American feel to the melody, which is kind of odd. Didn't think of it as Native American, but yeah, I can get I see where you get that from. Um, I just want to see a movie based on this song. Cause oh, it's, definitely. It's about a mercenary who, you know, kills his way through Africa for money, gets killed, gets his head taken off by by another shooter, comes back from the dead headless, and gets his revenge. Right. It's this ghost story, you know, uh, about this killer. Mm-hmm. And um I love how, it, you know, it, in the last verse, it's got this real subtle kind of military style drumming, which is the point where Roland dies. And then it comes back as a horror story. <laughs> and that's the thing with, with Zipon. He does entire movies mm-hmm. in about four minutes, less than yeah. four minutes. Like I said, it, it was great to do a, an album that didn't have any long songs, but <laughs> for a change, because it's been a while. Um, but Well, we just did Yes, so, you know. Yeah. Well, yes, uh, Aldemila, uh, Bozy Eleven Stevens, blah, blah, blah. Um, but this, even though it's like a three and change song, it feels long. It feels like an epic. 
yeah, seeing the time under four minutes now, I'm thinking like, wait a minute though, but did he just do this <laughs> this whole lengthy story? Yeah. But yeah, I, I love the harmonies in the second chorus, great bass tone. And we get these massive thunderous hits at the end where it just goes huge. Um, incidentally, this was the last song that Warren Zevon performed in front of an early audience on the Letterman show before his death in 2003. Wow, really? I mean, Letterman had him on mm-hmm. yeah, all, all the, the time. time. Yeah. Like, he was kind of the guy that he would get even, like, when Paul Schaefer was out. Right. right. He had him fill in as, like, band leader and mm-hmm. stuff. He was just a super fan. Yeah. On to track three, the title track, Excitable Boy. This is one of the ones that is sadly still relevant. Um, <laughs> It's just about how men get excused for being monsters. And this one in the song is literally a monster. And it, oh, yeah. it's a, he's just an excitable boy. Um, I would love to hear Lily Allen cover this. Oh, yeah. I was trying to think because I wanted to hear I want to hear a woman cover this because that puts all that really brings the point to the fore. Obviously, my first thought was Marion Call. But then I started thought about it for a bit. And I'm like, no. After Fuck You, I want to hear Lily Allen do this. <laughs> but love the piano riff. Love the hint of overdrive on the, the um, guitars. Love I was the... just thinking Tracy Bonham would be a good one to do, oh, yeah, too. Yeah. I I have to hear more of her stuff. All I know is the one song that got overplayed on MTV. Um, but I just love how he sardonically just addresses the topic. Because it's about a guy who, he starts off, he comes down to Sunday, he comes down to dinner his Sunday best and rubs pot roast on his chest. It's this weird, you know. <laughs> right. It's pretty much Jeffrey faux Dahmer. Pas. Hmm? <laughs> it's pretty much Jeffrey Dahmer. Years yeah. before the Jeffrey Dahmer story, of course. And then, you know, he bites an usher. He goes to the movies, he bites the usher in the leg, takes yeah. this girl, takes a little Susie to the prom and rapes her and kills her. And when he's let out of the home, he digs up her grave and builds a cage with her bones. And so he's oh, getting... He pre- rapes and kills her and then brings her home. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> um, so, and, and the chorus, he's, he was just an excitable boy. And in the yeah. chorus, the proper chorus, we get these kind of 50s style oohs and ahs. And with this sax 70s. riff. No, but it's in the very much in the 50s style, you know. Well, you know, the seventies had the whole fifties you know, retro thing, yeah. thing going right. on. Yeah, but it, it was borrowed from the fifties. It gives it this kind of innocence when we're talking about a rapist. I mean, this is Brock Turner. Yes, this is Brock Turner released it's decades before it's sadly Turner was born. So many dudes. Yeah, but I'm just—he was the latest example I could think of. You know, yeah, yeah. Zevon was dead before Turner was in the news. Um, <laughs> yeah. So long before. Um, so that's the sad thing is it's still relevant. And, you know, the last two verses still hit me like a ton of bricks, even though I know this song like the back of my hand. Yeah. Um, this is that's why I would love to hear a woman cover it, because it would really that that there would be an anger to it that you don't get with Zevon. You know, he's being yeah, sardonic and kind of, you know, good. That's what's chilling about it. Just the the way it's accepted, yeah. the way it's right. I mean, he was making a point by being kind of start being kind of ripped exactly. Attached, but yeah, exactly making it like cheerful sounding the mm-hmm. song. You yeah. know, it's just ah, what, what can you do? Boys will be boys. You know, right. kind of thing. He was going for very grim humor. Yes, which I totally get, but I think having a woman cover it, slow it down, do it angry makes the point yeah. better. Really would hit the point home. On to track four, Werewolves of London. Now this song began as a joke by Phil Everly of the Everly Brothers to Zevon in 75, <laughs> two years before it was recorded. Um, Everly had watched a television broadcast of the 35 film Werewolves of London, or Werewolf of London, and suggested to Zevon that he adapt the title for a song and a dance craze. <laughs> Zivon and co-writers Leroy Marinelli or Marinelli and Wadi Watel played with the idea and wrote the song in about 15 minutes, all contributing I mean, musically, lyrics. Musically, it's, it's just one riff. Home, Alabama. 
it's fun <laughs> riff, yeah. Um, but, you know, they've all contributed to the lyrics. Soon after, Jackson Brown saw the lyrics and thought Werewolves of London had potential and began performing it at his own shows before it was <laughs> recorded. Um, I, if your Halloween playlist doesn't include this song, yeah, it, yeah. it sucks. Um, they tried seven different configurations of players in the studio before being satisfied with Mc, with Fleetwood Mac. I'm just going to say it's Fleetwood Mac because that's who the band is named after. Fleetwood and McVeigh. Pretty much, yeah. Um, they've been the only constants throughout the career or at the band. Um, they The protracted time in the studio and all the musicians' fees led to it eating up most of the album's budget. But yeah, it's very repetitive, but it is such a just a great riff. Love the groove. It's an absolute classic. But it's I mean, just... music is just Sweet Home Alabama. Uh, it's it's the lyrics. It's the it's close. Yeah, it's the wolf. You know, yeah. it's you it's know just that, fun. that's what makes the song. You know, I I spent most of the time listening to it, lip syncing and dancing. Um, great <laughs> and solo. I think they, made, they probably be remade Werewolves of London. Uh-huh. But yeah, American Werewolf in London just for this because the song. <laughs> right, right. But just for the wordplay, I, I just love the line, he's that hairy headed gent who ran amok in Kent. Oh yeah, little old lady got mutilated. I mean yeah. just, that that flow is just amazing. Yeah, yeah. And and I mean, that's in a way it's almost like he sampled Sweet Home Alabama and rapped over it kind of. And <laughs> only he had yeah. Like Fleet, yeah, Fleetwood Mac do it for right, him. Right, right. Um, and and that line, and actually, come to think of it, of Excitable Boy, really kind of get across what about this reminded me so much of Vonnegut. And just for those who don't know, I read most of Vonnegut's work in my early twenties, and it formed about eighty percent of my personality. He's one of my absolute biggest heroes. Yeah. Vonnegut could say the most depressing shit in the most matter-of-fact tone. Yeah, and so it goes. Exactly. And that's what he, he you know, um, Zivon has this absolutely horrifying things, like Excitable Boy or this old lady got mutilated, and makes it fun. Well, it's it's the, the syllables, though. And, you know, little yeah. old lady got mutilated. <laughs> yeah. Right. But that's what gave me a Vonnegut feel. Um, and that's one of the yeah. things I love about this album. Oh, to, I, after yeah. that, it was like, oh, I'd like to meet his tailor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is probably one of the best lines of the song. Because it's mm. like, you're just talking about this horrific monster. And it's right. like, hey, who does but his, his clothes? His hair was his perfect. Hair was perfect. Yeah. <laughs> and I always, when I hear that line, I always think back to the ad for, I think it was Cocktail. Or one of the Tom, some Tom Cruise movie. Maybe um, but the pool one. Or that use this song. I mean, in a way, he's talking about it's almost the same theme as the mo- the song before, mm-hmm. where these horrific things are yeah. happening, and it's society is just like, ah, hey, what can you do? Right. And, uh, oh, right. but th- they're really focused on how he looks. Right. You yeah. Know? Yeah. True. True. On to track five, accidentally like a martyr. I love that title because of the way it's used in the song. Um, great contrast. They go into a ballad after this, you know, just really fun, you know, upbeat song. The lyrics just beautifully express heartbreak. Um, I was trying to get at what he was getting at here. Um, it kind of dragged on for me though. So I'm picking this one as my weakest. Okay. I just, the, the, the line in the chorus that uses the title accidentally like a martyr, the hurt gets worse as, as the heart gets harder love the accidents i rarely comment on the poetics of a lyric but just you know well, you got gets it gets worse him. as her gets harder love the That's accidents the there piece of this yeah um but accidentally like a martyr in other words i didn't intend to do it but i'm gonna use but i'm gonna you know use it to kind of make myself feel better <laughs> i'm gonna play the martyr even though i didn't intend to do the thing you know i'm gonna i did like the piano break in the middle oh i love that this yeah. this chord solo that's almost classical, but not the the harmonic complexity blew my mind a little bit. That's where I realized Zivon was was a much better piano player than I ever thought he was, or keyboardist yeah, in general. Impressive that it was him, yeah. Yeah, he played all the keys. I, I there were a bunch of other credits on the album that I didn't read. None of them were keyboards. He played all the keys. Um, but I also love the way the bass leads that whole section. Um, 
And beyond that, it's a ballad about a, a failed relationship. But it's just, I love the way he just expresses that heartbreak. And that oddly sends side one. <laughs> it does. Um, and then another great contrast, not track six, nighttime in the switching yard. Um, he goes kind of funk. Right. I, I kind of like it. Um, got a great groove. Um, reminds me a bit of Shakedown Street by the Dead. Um, also, a lot of the stuff the Stones were doing in the 70s. Um, like, why would they have gone for this as a single? Yeah, true. Um, it's fairly cliche. The lyrics don't say much, but it's just a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Just the music. Yeah. This is like probably one of the strongest musical. Yeah tracks on here i mean mostly we're going here for lyrics but th- this is you know mm-hmm. musically this really brings it yeah it's it's and musically it's it's very cliche it's just 70s funk 70s mm-hmm. you know and you know for lack of a better way of putting it 70s white boy funk um but it's just but it's fun you know yeah and Love how the synth and guitar play play off of each other in the solo. That's the obvious synthesizer. I think that's the only synthesizer yeah. I noticed was during the solo. Um, some great harmonies toward the end. It's you know, like Werewolves in London. It's just kind of fun. Um, on to track seven, Veracruz. This is going to get me laughed at, but I did enjoy the pan pipes at the beginning. <laughs> I I did not find them you know funny so <laughs> yeah. they succeeded and i mean this is before panpipes were a thing that's or a true. cliche um right love the melody this is around the time when that was leading up to that right though. right right i mean they're they're you know people have used keyboards in that time mm-hmm. you know yeah um love the melody this is just another great spot for a ballad because it's right after the, fu- the funk song um this is i think his best vocal on the album could be, yeah. I mean, and just this whole story of us fucking in Mexico. Yeah. Um, love. Some of our last fuckery. Yeah, yeah. Um, politically, so geopolitically, that's what you mean. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, this is another one right here, a ton of graphing in the melody. Um, the Spanish in the chorus was a really nice surprise. And the chorus is really pretty after this gut wrenching verse, which I, mm-hmm. I loved that contrast. Um, you know, the, the, the verse just talks about yeah, how we've just destroyed that part of the U.S., you know, with our foreign, op- or foreign policy, just destroyed that part of the world. And then you get this really pretty chorus in Spanish. Yeah, it is. It's a beautiful track. Mm-hmm. It's only three and a half minutes. Again. It's again. It's like this crazy epic story mm-hmm. in, in it's just three and a half minutes. Yes. Yeah. It's amazing that he could do that. On to track eight, Tenderness on the Block, another ballad. Um, this was my second pick for second weakest, but the arrangement is really interesting. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm with you because I would kind of be like, ah, you know, what is he doing? But yeah, the music, like, it's kind of what the doors would have sounded like right. if Morrison had yeah. survived. Right. Um, love the harpsichord. I think it's a harpsichord on the riff. Yeah. Um, the, mel- the harmonies in the chorus are great. Love how the bass kind of leads the riff through the verse. Great slide guitar solo. Um, nice, interesting, crunchy guitars coming in at the end that just kind of add a little punch. Not a song you would expect like, a little crunch on either. It's definitely like a Manzarek Krieger kind of feel. Yeah, very with much. The play between the guitars, yeah. the harpsichord, and the piano. You could definitely hear Manzarek playing that mm-hmm. and Krieger playing the, the guitar on it right. too. But it, it's I about, mean, you know, obviously an influence from the doors. Yeah, it's about a teenage girl getting heartbroken, but she'll be OK. It's that kind of yeah. song. Um, but yeah, I feel Pink Floyd. I think that there's a couple on this album that Pink Floyd really seriously borrowed for really? the Division Bell. OK, yeah. <laughs> interesting. Um, yeah. I only know Keep Talking. It's literally the only song I've heard on Division Bell. <laughs> After that, I was kind of like, yeah, I think I'll skip this one. You weren't missing much, honestly. That was one of the stronger tracks. Well, actually, no, that was not. That was pretty bad, that one. Yeah. Um, On to the final track, track nine, Lawyers, Guns, and Money. The third one that I know very, very well. Um, I've heard this a few times before, and this this is my pick for strongest because it's uh just so 
crazy. <laughs> if Roland hadn't blown my mind, it probably would be my pick too. Um, <laughs> love the opening riff. This has been a favorite of my one of my favorites of his for decades. Love the bass part, and it's another but, one that is sadly still relevant, and I think especially relevant right now in the U.S. Yes, because certain yeah. people are definitely in a lawyer's guns and money situation. <laughs> And um, he does this whole, like, this is the best movie on the album. Yeah, and yeah, it's like, yeah. like, this is the one that I'd really want to see the movie version done of. Uh, and it's only three and a half minutes also. And you, you say movie, but this one, for some re- weird reason, reminds me of Miami Vice. I don't think I ever heard it in a Miami Vice episode, but the subject matter is very Miami Vice. Yeah. It's it, very it mid-80s, you know money fetishing kind of you know it's very yeah. much of that mid 80s a little bit ahead of that but the money fetishing and i uh, love the the chorus i'm an innocent bystander and somehow i got stuck between a rock and a hard place and i'm down on my luck it's about a rich guy who fucks a waitress who happened to be a russian spy gambles in cuba gets right. busted for something, ends up hiding in Honduras, and he's constantly asking his father, send lawyers, guns, and money to get me out of this shit. <laughs> <laughs> asking his father to bail him out of whatever whatever he's dug himself into. I mean, does he I don't think he actually mentions cocaine in the lyrics. No, but it's but definitely you can part just of it. Visualize yeah. mountains of it. Right. You know, Tony Montana. Yeah. <laughs> I was gambling in Havana. I took a little risk. Some lawyers, guns, and money. Dad, get me out of this. You know, now I'm hiding in Honduras. I'm a desperate man. Send lawyers, and gun- lawyers, guns, and money. The shit has hit the fan. Safe bet cocaine was involved. Oh, definitely. Uh, and one thing, one band that I can tell you, I think, took their entire sound from this song okay. and a lot of songs from Zevon mm-hmm. would be the tragically hip. Oh yeah. I only know like fully completely, but I need to hear more catalog. of their stuff. But yeah, I can definitely uh, hear it. You know, I've been to Canada a lot, so oh, yeah, you you're you're <laughs> Canadian by I've marriage, heard. so yeah, you're you're probably pretty familiar with T Hip. Like man, when he passed too, that lead the lead singer uh-huh. from it, like I mean, it was like a constant for like a couple of weeks right, of just right. their whole catalog. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because they're like the Canadian National Band or something. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they are the Canadian Beatles. <laughs> yeah. I love Fully Completely. I have to dig into more other catalog. Um, but yeah, I It defi- sounds like this. <laughs> yeah, I definitely hear the, the influence, yeah. It totally sounds like this. Even the singer, Gordon something, or Gord something, or mm-hmm. I can't remember his last name. Oh, yeah. Of course it's Gordon. <laughs> yeah, but he was very Zivon influenced. Yeah, I can hear it. Um, yeah. But love how the claps at the end punctuate this one really nicely. It's just a nice, simple, sardonic rocker to go out on. Love the lead guitar yeah. at the end. Um, so, do you recommend it? I do. I do. It's a lot of fun. The, I mean, lyrically, it's just fucking brilliant. Mm-hmm. Uh, musically, I mean, there's some parts where it's a little, you know, of its time. Uh, too much of its time. and But there's some interesting moments there, too. I absolutely strenuously recommend it. I need to dig into more of Yvonne's stuff after this. This album, yeah, there are a couple of mess songs on it, but this reminded me of why I love music. And I honestly can't give it higher praise than that. Yeah, um, yeah, it's very high. That's it for Excitable Boy. Until next time, we'll be finishing the year with a review of Dr. My Own Patience by Serengeti and Sicker Man, as well as revealing our best of the year list. We don't do a worst list on the hearing because we pick all the albums and it would be a very short list. Um, yeah. There's a particular album that I think we'll both be giving a shout out to, though. <laughs> Probably, yeah. Until then, of course, always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life, there you are. There you are.